Hello, and welcome to Grief Tending. This is a podcast series that aims to support anyone who is in a caregiving role to someone who is grieving. These conversations are seeking to cultivate our collective capacities to be alongside grief in supportive ways. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians on whose unceded lands these interviews are recorded, the Turrbal and Yagara people. I would like to acknowledge their ongoing connection to land, waters and culture. I'd like to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and to extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander listeners. This episode sits within the community stream of our series and is titled To Err on the Side of Love, Gentle Offerings of Reconnection in Grief. Our guest for this episode is Ladybird Morgan. Ladybird is a registered nurse, clinical social worker, registered craniosacral therapist practitioner, and co-founder of the Humane Prison Hospice Project. Ladybird has 20 plus years experience in hospice and palliative care, addressing trauma, mental health challenges, and repercussions of sexual violence. Ladybird guides medical practitioners, families, caregivers, and institutions around the world on how to be present to difficult experiences by remembering, embodying, and responding from the deepest place of truth. Ladybird also co-facilitates Commonweal's Cancer Care Help Program Healing Circles, UCSF's Merry Center's Last Acts of Kindness, and is a study therapist with a University of Washington study of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. In this conversation with Ladybird, um, which is a longer form than a number of our um, a number of our episodes, uh, the the topic of the pace of grief and how how radically different um, the pace of life can change when we are grieving, whether we're caring for someone who is seriously ill or um, whether we're experiencing bereavement, someone we, we love or cared for has recently died. The pace at which the rest of the world appears to be moving, or the pace at which we may be moving, um, can often be very, very different from our usual um, or more everyday rhythm. And that can be one of the things that's really disorienting for people in grief. And it can be one of the things that I think in bringing awareness to some permission to move slower, some permission to quote unquote be less productive in kind of that driven you know, sense where people might feel guilty for doing things like staying in bed when they need to rest or not doing as many things as they feel they quote unquote should in a day or used to be able to in a day. But I mention all of these things around rhythm and pace because this was also reflected in the in the rhythm and flow of the episode itself. So I think this is what led in part to it, it being uh, a longer conversation. And it's also one which you might find more helpful to listen to at a particular time of day. It's, it's a more expansive uh, and less, I suppose, less scripted conversation to allow room for some of those wonderings. Um, and so some of the things that we wondered about um, and Ladybird shared these, these really valuable insights around the difference of what happens or, or what can be invited, what can be made space for when caregivers approach supporting grieving people from a place of offering companionship rather than trying to bring mastery into the room, which very often takes up a lot more room and space. Um, we also explored this idea of how very, very small acts, like seemingly minute acts of sensory experience or of kindness to ourselves, can form um, something of a breadcrumb trail of relationality, um, back to a sense of reconnection to certain parts of ourselves, um, to other people, or to the more than human world. I really valued the the wonderings and the exploration around what it is to imagine ourselves in connection to the broader web of being while we are grieving. So we talk about companion animals and plants and the, the wider sense of how we think about the world in which we exist. 
This is something that's not often explored within grief, which is often psychologized and kind of placed into the individual experience rather than maybe wondered about from what is it to be an individual having an experience of grief within um, within a much broader um, web of being, web of existence in the world. Um, we, we also went on to, to wonder about, as I said, these, these gentle actions, these gentle uh, offerings towards reconnection. Um, not meaning that you have to achieve a certain number of things in order to, to succeed at reconnection in a particular um, you know, predetermined timeline. But that by taking very gentle acts, the example of whether or not you get out of bed and whether or not you feel guilty for that um, as someone who might be grieving or whether you are trying to encourage someone to um, you know not be in bed or, or um, yeah it's just it was exploring questions of what it might mean to be very gentle and very kind to oneself both as someone who's grieving but also as a caregiver when we you know we can often I don't know about you, but for myself, even when we've shown up and tried to be supportive to someone, we can often replay the actions we did or didn't do and wonder, was that enough? Um, should I have done more? Should I have done that differently? And so this is where the title of today's episode came from, that in any of those situations that we might err on the side of love and might be very gentle to ourselves and seek to find whatever it might be in our contexts that look like small and minute but kind acts of, of reconnection either to ourselves or those around us. So uh, whoever you are and whatever context you're listening to this in, I uh, hope that there's something supportive and helpful for you. Thanks for listening. Hi Ladybird, thanks so much for joining us for this episode. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Mm, it's lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so I wanted to start, you know, by asking you about um, this idea that can often be prevalent for caregivers. And, and when I say caregivers, I mean professional, it might be hospice or palliative care workers, but also family members, community members. There's some ideas that can be projected onto caregivers um, as being somehow um, superhuman or saints or having doing things that nobody else could do and they kind of get you know can get placed on a pedestal mm -hmm. um, I heard you speaking in in another interview about one of the things that you really value in in hospice work is is not that I think you I'll paraphrase you at best but mm -hmm. I think you said something along the lines of it's not that a nurse or a chaplain or a social worker is doing something that no one else can do but that they're bringing an, a, pre, um, a presence um, mm -hmm. to, to support someone being with their own awareness of their experience, whether that's with mm -hmm. illness or um, approaching death or with grief, um, and that that can offer agency to people, that they, mm -hmm. are, they may have more capacity than they think they do to be with mm -hmm. an experience. They may, in fact, already be being with that experience. Um, mm -hmm. And this seems to me to be a really important and not so often talked about thing in terms of caregivers' roles. Um, mm. You know, that something about the, the presence um, and the accompanying people, that this could be offered by almost anyone in someone's network. And so while absolutely there are specialist medical and clinical mm -hmm. skills that support someone's experience of illness, yeah. when we zoom out, what, one of the things that people really need at all stages through that is people who are willing to show up and, and not look away and be present. So I wondered if you could speak about, speak about that, some of the challenges that that might present for caregivers, some of the mm. things that can be helpful. Mm. Wow. If that's what I said, that was <laughs> that was quite beautiful. <laughs> so thank you for that paraphrasing. Um, it was lovely how you articulated that. 
a couple of things come to mind. The first one is how sometimes misunderstood the word presence can be. The assumption that presence means stillness or understanding or uh, perfection, mastery. And I don't think of any of those things as a part of presence. They can be included. I mean, sorry, they are a part of presence, but it's not the, the outcome of presence. And when I think of the difference between a, a professional caregiver who comes in and is offering something to a caregiver, a caregiver who's already in the home or in the facility, the difference might be as subtle as hopefully the professional or the person who has the, the title has been taking some time, some very focused, intentional time to understand their role in relationship to suffering, in relationship to impermanence, in relationship to um, sorrow and regret, so that they're not showing up as an empty slate. Actually, they're showing up with some, uh, some depth to their capacity. And that, that presence, a, a, a real... Um, vibrant presence, uh, a soft presence, a full presence, to me, doesn't take up all the space in the room, right? It actually welcomes the rest of the room to arrive, to meet your presence. So the difference I see now sometimes is that these, the, the things that we're cultivating and the skill sets and becoming specialists in all of these areas, we end up coming into the room and taking up a lot of the space. And the, the client, the patient, and even the caregivers who are there doing all of this work somehow shrink a little bit in the presence. And, and my, in my thoughts is that I don't want people to shrink. I don't want a presence to shrink anything. I want that presence to actually welcome them to then feel like, oh, yes, I'm here. I'm doing this. I can be here. I can do this. I was already doing it versus you expert person. <laughs> Um, and that's, you know, not, again, not dismissing the skills and the knowledge and all of the things that we bring into caregiving, which are absolutely important, but um, hopefully they're not ever louder than mm. the voices of the people who are going through the experience. Mm. Yeah, the two notions of space and volume really stick out to me in, in, in the nuance, like this, because it, it feels like I'm kind of describing something that that is more subtle. I don't know if refined is the right word, but there's, like you say, it's kind of next to or alongside the the clinical skills. Um, yeah, it's a companioning, but, right? Not a, and I think it's that piece of that offering companionship versus uh, mastery. And we're very, especially in the in the U.S., we're very focused on mastery of oh, this is I am this this is me and that's that's a very loud <laughs> it's a very loud noise yeah and doesn't leave doesn't often leave a lot of room like you're saying and one of the things that is always in the room it seems when in palliative care and and um, caring with complex illness is is the unknown and the uncertain and I think the way in which that is met um, often seems more supported if there can be some space left. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the unknown, the uncertain, and the, the grief, right? I mean, this piece that it's okay to be sad that you're dying. You don't have to be jumping up and down and excited and all at peace and okay. I mean, that's lovely when someone is has done their work and their life and they have the time and everything's in place and what an incredible opportunity to be able to leave your life in that way and <laughs> you can still die without all of that it's really okay and i i sometimes feel like there's a push for people to master and perfect their death also mm -hmm. and that space for the messiness of it is not always there, especially when a master of death comes in the room, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to help you get everything under control. <laughs> yeah, and become an expert. Get this, this. sorted out, yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's there. Yeah, that's so important. Hmm. You know, I'm thinking you, as you start to mention the grief through through all of you know experiences and stages of, of someone's illness and an approaching death. Um, it's so often used, so often described, sorry, in terms of coping or management. I think I've heard you speak about this as well. Um, uh, and strategies, you know, strategized. I've, I've often found it difficult. That I don't think grief responds well to being strategized against. Mm. <laughs> um, with some understanding that I think what people are often searching for in that language is some practicality, some mm. orientation, mm -hmm. some way to be with this deep lostness or or out of controlness. Um, but there seems to be a, a real link in some of what you're saying to, it's like a really different framing for people than thinking of grief as being managed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or grief just being yours, right? I think that's another piece, and I, I tend to have a, a very, um, not so much existential, but it's a, it's a pretty wide lens of where I'm operating out of, where I'm, how I'm orienting, and it's not just in my community or in my city or in my country even. When I really get to places of deep grief or confusion or distress, for me, orienting back into the universe is actually really helpful. That might be horrifying for some people, but for me, it's actually really helpful in that it's not that there is another person that is going to directly direct my care or understand it, or I'm sorry, my grief or understand it intensely, but that I'm I'm a part of this bigger picture and the universe is also holding me or being held like this whole thing about being held and holding where I'm in a, a relational field of just living is relational and it's not just me and my title and my exterior persona and the way that I engage, but this planet <laughs> has an energetic quality to it. I'm, I'm relating to it all the time. I'm not always paying attention to it because I'm in the house and I'm on a chair and I'm on the computer. And so I forget that there is this vast support that is also observing and witnessing me and experiencing me. And so it helps me to not put it all on the onus of other humans. Hmm. that makes sense <laughs> yeah i think it does and i'm just trying to think about you know if people are listening a way way to link that in and maybe one step is you know and a very direct one that people if we move beyond humans and thinking in the family home or the bedroom and like mm -hmm. people very quickly often look to companion animals mm -hmm. and understand that there there's a depth of mm -hmm. of presence and mm -hmm. of companioning and exchange mm -hmm. um not just of energy but of of deep care and connection yeah and so maybe that could be if people are listening to this and, and, and maybe just trying to grapple with hang on we've gone <laughs> we've gone quite big here um yeah. the the animals like that that is very present for for children right the way through the lifespan people there's an understanding i think especially yeah. in grief um of that i'm not quite sure if it would fit into that holding and being held but um, Absolutely, it does. In yeah. fact, that's those are the breadcrumbs, right? That you can actually okay. I can't. I can't manage to take a shower today, but I can put my hand on the cat, and that's that relational thing that you're that you're reaching out and remembering that you are not alone. So I say the universe, but you're not alone in your house necessarily. If you have an animal, mm -hmm. if you don't have an animal, there is a blade of grass outside. Hopefully, somewhere there is a tree. There's a bug. Mm -hmm. There's uh, the sound of wind or cars, even if you're in a very urban area, you know, you're still mm -hmm. on the planet. My point being that we can be in such a place of grief around the loss of a, of a human connection that we 
forget how to connect to the rest of what's all around us. And the beauty of that is when we, we don't even have to fully remember, we just get to lay back because we're actually already in the world. We don't have to go someplace. We just have to turn our attention for a moment to be like, oh, right, I'm here. That might be a horrifying, like, oh, I'm still here. And this, and this person that I love is not. How can I possibly still be here? It doesn't take that away necessarily, but it's just a little subtle piece. And yeah, touching a pet, touching your house plant, you know, going outside and just feeling air, the temperature change on your skin, these embodied ways of, of reminding ourselves of things that we can't force. Right? Mm-hmm. We feel the breeze, we feel the rain, we feel the sun, and we allow ourselves to have a sensory experience that hopefully can transport us back to connection. Mm. Yeah, as, you, as you're speaking, I'm thinking for people, you know, if we, if we zoom out to that idea of, of taking a walk outside, so here in Australia, that's typically called a bushwalk. You know, mm-hmm. people will often describe a sense of calm, a sense of peace, a sense of connection, um, at being in natural environments and spaces when all of those elemental um, presences are, are there. So whether or not people have you know, even the language or, or some framework to to describe that i think people may have a sense of the felt experience of that yeah and we don't have to even complicate it too much you know let's say you're bed let's say you're not able to walk that's not something that's comfortable for you or even possible you're you're in your home and you're not getting out can you open can you get a different texture or scent or smell get cinnamon out of your cupboard you know if there's a lemon or an apple or any type of fruit in your house peel it and smell it you know, go back to really simple actions where you're just relating to the sensory world from the beginning. Mm. You're calling yourself back to your body through the senses, not through the mind. Because the mind is, is, in, is in a place of grief, and that's, that's appropriate, right? So you're, it's like these little, they're not tricks, they're just reminders. And animals can do that because they're not caught up in your mind, <laughs> You know, they're just, they're doing their animal things. Mm. And then you are reaching in towards them. And that's a lovely thing to be able to do. Mm. Calling yourself back to, to your body through your senses. I think he said. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, the relationship people may have with their, their body in grief can be, vast and very unique and very dynamic mm-hmm. but it just came to came to mind while you were speaking this um highlighting the difference of being with the mind in the mind in in a way that mm-hmm. can often again take up more space and volume as you were saying at the beginning yeah. i'm not trying to set up a dichotomy or a, a split between the two that it's either or because the mind is part of the body. Um, but I wondered if you could speak to, yeah, some of the, the importance of relating to the body in grief. Yeah, I mean, it's so important. I don't know that it's possible to not, and sometimes that relating can be really subdued, you know, very subtle, right, very gentle, that, we're not pushing or pulling our bodies unless we, that's now we feel like we want that or we are calling for that. And sometimes we need that, that nudge or someone to drag us into another reality, into another place, just because we're not able to do it. But it's also, I mean, from my, in my perspective, especially in the early stages of allowing yourself to really immerse yourself in grief because it will pass. If it doesn't pass, then we get the, sort, the help and the support that we need to find our way through that. But these initial moments of profound grief, a loss of someone that is so dear, you know, I think about smelling clothing items of someone I've loved that, you know, trying to keep that scent as long as possible. And because it's, it's such a gift to have even the memory that that's, that's where the grief becomes personal. So listening to the body, 
not in a, as a way to direct it or mandate things, but to allow it to really find again. You know, we know for the most part how to be <laughs> ourselves. We don't usually give a lot of space for curiosity and for discovery. So can we discover what grief is awakening in us? What it's leading me to? What it's leading me away from? And you know, I, I would say for people, like really only in the moments where you're, the grief is not allowing you to connect anymore, that's different. Right? So to let sort of those waves of, of disconnection, but then kind of finding your way back. And I, when I talk to clients and they say, how do I know I've gone too far? Or when, when am I in trouble? You know, and I would say when you can't connect anymore, then have someone that you have appointed to reach in for you. You know, that you've given them that permission to do that. I'm wondering, you know, for, for people who may be listening and are maybe concerned or, or worried about the intensity of ways that grief can show up in the body. Um, or in bodily patterns, I think of sleep and mm-hmm. and eating yeah. um, as two big ones. That I think the struggle, the impact of those realities and the struggle, can often seem to surprise, if not really worry people. Yeah. Um, and these seem. Um, you know, it's often it's even challenging to speak about because they're a real and an intense part of grief. But I find myself wanting to say that's a very normal. Well, as soon as we say mm-hmm. normal, it's like, mm-hmm. how do you fit normal into an experience that is, for many people, is so far outside of their frame of reference for the rest of life? Yeah. Well, and, and when it generally feels as though it won't shift, that this is the new. If we're going to use the word normal, this is the new normal. This. This uh, carved out, hollowed out, brittle, um, heavy, despondent, you know, flat, like where things are not, there is no, there's just not, there isn't, those connections are not there. And to somehow, I mean, when you mentioned the pets, it's so perfect because there's not that expectation of communication necessarily, right? You get to be in these places of disconnection and still be connected. And that's what I would say is, you know, really finding, even if it's somebody you pay, even if it's a stranger or a neighbor that you feel like you can say, can you, can you be with me when I'm disconnected and falling apart? And can that be safe for you? Right? Because it does feel terrifying. There is a, an, an amazement almost of like, this is still going on. How could I possibly be still so overcome by my sadness you know how could I still start crying in the middle of the day I thought I thought there was enough time now I should be at this other place with it I shouldn't be so unable or unwilling to connect with other people and there isn't really a rule about it until and this is where again it, it's so helpful I mean I understand that there are some people that really don't have anyone that's in their life in that way and for that, I would say, please reach out and get someone <laughs> that you can at least pay a, a stranger, a consultant, because this, these are the small, small things that allow us to, to find our way back when we can't lead, get ourselves back there. Mm. We can come back from grief. We do return from grief, and it's usually in community, even if that community is just one other being. Right? That's mm. a community of two. Mm. You don't have to make it a big deal. But we are communal beings. We are living in a, on a planet that's full of life. Right? We're not actually, we might live alone, but we're not really alone. And there's something really important about knowing that mm. and believing that. Yeah. Yeah, as you're, as you're sp- speaking to this idea of of being in community, even with one person or somebody being that point of connection. Um, 
you know, it's taking me right back to the start of our conversation and this idea of um, so often now because of the way that grief has been um, over-medicalized um, in companioning people who are grieving, I think community members can often feel, um, people often use this phrase here, I'm not qualified mm -hmm. <laughs> to support this person. Mm -hmm. um, and I think coming back to this idea of being able to, to, to show up with this deeper understanding of presence, it doesn't mean kind of pretending to have this figured out, but also not, not walking in thinking that you need to offer answers or solutions or to know any more than you do. Yeah. Um, this permission seems to often be missing from, mm -hmm. from like the, uh, I don't want to say job description, <laughs> 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 from, the, <laughs> from the role of being a support to someone who's grieving. Mm -hmm. um, and so on the one hand, there's this encouragement for people to reach out and seek that connection, but I'm also, yeah, I'm just really wanting to continue to highlight that there isn't a need to have this figured out. It's actually a request to be with someone in the unfigured yes. -ness. And And just to even have an awareness that someone is there, right? So there are plenty of people, and myself included, actually, that I I don't need to be around a lot of people when I'm grieving. That isn't, that isn't mm. particularly helpful for me. Mm. But I let people know that I'm grieving. So there's a, they know that I'm out there grieving and I'll maybe go out and be in nature more or just spend the time alone on the couch, you know, staring out the window. But there's a knowing that people are aware that I'm in that space. And so there's a touchstone if I want it. Mm. Right. And, but yeah, that community, when I said so I talk about community, I mean community of earth <laughs> that you can go and lay down on the ground. And that is, that's beautifully being held can be right listening to the ocean um even even art and music and movies you know i think of i don't think of them as distractions i think of them as again sort of leading us back to places where we can feel where we can be surprised where we can follow a thread to back to to um to something mm -hmm. so I, I think they are beautiful tools of of holding us so it doesn't have to be a person per se, but I, I am partial to, you know, not being, having somebody not have a human being on the planet earth, even if it's in another country, even if it's, you know, a hotline, mm. Hey, I'm calling you. There's no one else for me to call. I just want you to know that I'm having a really hard time. Can I call you in a week? Can you call me in a week? You know? mm. Mm. So solitariness is also a beautiful place to be. So I, I'm not dismissing and solitude. Yeah, but people having a sense of agency and choosing one or the other, because mm -hmm. equally if people are wanting mm -hmm. some time and some space, I think the, the incessant calling, yes. people dropping in unannounced, these kind of things. Yeah, and then you end up taking, the, the need is that you end up taking care of the caregivers, right? That's something right. I hear very frequently, actually, when people are in deep grief that a lot of the very well-intentioned beautiful giftings of love and support is a bit much mm. and it ends up becoming again that piece about hopefully the, the the person with the title going in as caregiver is not smothering or having that person take care of my discomfort because i'm really worried about them and i don't want i don't want you to be so sad so i better do something <laughs> Mm. Um, and that is energetically felt, right? We feel people's urgency. We feel the discomfort, even if you don't say anything. And so people start to hide away. They don't answer the phone. They don't go to the door. What are some ways you think that people might, um, you know, people who, who are either now in a position of, of being caregivers to friends, family members, or someone's thinking about how might I be, how might I be supportive in the future? You know, what are some ways that, that might mm -hmm. invite um, some curiosity about like how to know, like people being like, have I done that? 
do I do that? <laughs> I know. I would say err on the side of, of, of love. Just, you know, I mean, mm. it's similar that I say to people, I, what I used to talk about when, especially when I was working more at the bedside and there were, there was a lot of focus on people maybe want you to leave the room when they're dying. And there's this whole thing that, you know, you shouldn't be right at the bedside. Maybe they want that space. And then everybody kind of focused on that. Like, okay, you should necessarily, you should actually leave and let the person die alone or, should I have left? Should I not have left? And then like, oh my goodness, do what you are called to do. At the end of the day, follow your heart and trust that something will evolve. And you might step on a toe. You might be offensive. You might get offended. And that's okay. You know, what I hear from people that have gone through really challenging things and a lot, they appreciate the support. The support is appreciated. Whether they can take it in, whether they can respond back, that's the piece that you get to let go of as the person on the other side that you're not expecting. Oh, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, would you want to come in and have share that pie with me, right? Maybe they can't even open their mouth to not take it personally and reach out. Better to reach out than to be sitting at home agonizing over, oh my gosh, I wish I had, I wish I had done that, right? So to err on the side of love, yes. to, to reach out and to not take it personally. It yeah, like and, man, and you will, and I do, and it's hard. I mean, I, <laughs> I still struggle with it. I still, there's moments in, in friends where I feel like, oh, was I there enough? Did I mm. say the right thing? Should I have called earlier or later? Or, you know, yeah. ah, it's just like all of this should, could. And the point is that I love them yeah. and that I'm concerned and that I'm feeling great. I'm also feeling sad knowing about how what they're going through. That's really what it's about. And I don't want them to take care of me in that place. That's For me, that's really important, that they know that they don't need to take care of me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, some other um, guests in the series have been talking about that, the importance of um, maybe just being, uh, being attentive to when we turn towards showing up for the person with illness, the person who's grieving as a supporter, being a bit tidy about um, our own, uh, what we are offering and other things not bleeding out with that, as in mm. I'm feeling sad that you're so sad, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that we would turn, you know, if we imagine it in, in circle, yeah. circular sense, that we would turn outwards to seek that. And I wonder if that relates to some of the, the ways that you speak about holding and being held and whether you could talk around the need for both of those things to be uh, involved. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's so, it's just such a dance, you know? I mean, I really honestly, if I look at my own, if I reflect on my own life, I can think of a million times where I feel like I didn't do it very well um, or would have done it differently. And I think that's just the nature of grief. It's very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. So there's not a lot of, there's a lot of more discomfort than comfort. Mm -hmm. And it's also really great to grieve with someone. I mean, there are those moments where that's actually called for, right? That you're both really sad and that person can look at you and see that you're also feeling really sad and there can be uh, a, a relational quality to that. That's also, excuse me, important. So I, I think, I guess I'm just saying there are, there's no rules. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's really there's very few rules outside of just chaos and completely not listening. Um, that, that rarely happens to such an extreme place. And usually that's happening when we're pretty disconnected from our own discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. So my teacher, one of the things that she said that I loved was always, you know, first rule is mind your own business. <laughs> If you can start with minding your own business, then everything else after that will hopefully line up the way that it needs to. And it doesn't mean you don't pay attention, but are you are you minding your business first? Because mm. if you're not, then you don't really know where it is. You don't know if you've thrown it to somebody else or not. If you're not tracking it. Mm. I was struck when you were talking about the presence of discomfort and that grief is, there's a lot of discomfort and being uncomfortable. I think I have 
often see this confusion that maybe because there's discomfort, that means that people aren't aren't doing okay, aren't mm-hmm. at being with grief. That that grieving will inevitably involve discomfort. Mm-hmm. It's kind of part of the experience. But there's so much social conditioning yeah. against getting away from discomfort as quickly as possible, getting away from suffering as quickly as possible, rather than cultivating some capacity to be with it. This is not some kind of, um, you know, appeal to to be with those things all the time. It's Again, it's not an either or, but that the presence of those things don't, don't necessarily signal a crisis or, or a, you know, something being drastically wrong outside of the context that you're in. In fact, it can be quite appropriate to be yeah. experiencing those things. Yeah, I mean, in situations of, you know, and you've had this on the program before, I mean, there's complicated grief, there's prolonged, I mean, there's different gradations of what we're talking about, but in healthy grief over a lifespan, it's also... In, in my mind, it's also my thread to this beloved being and person. You know, I'm thinking about even just the death of my grandmother, and that was in 2020, which already is feeling far away. I still think about her every single day and can still even cry and be so kind of shocked about it. And I'm also aware of the distance. I'm also aware that my grief has changed. My my proximity to this person has changed just because of the nature of time. And so I can even long for the grief that I had before, right? So to kind of remember that in the moment, the new grief, that's your, that's your gift. This is your connection. Move through it, welcome it, honor it, share it. And then let's see what happens as time goes on. But at the moment, it's it's your connection to this beloved, right? That's how I, I think of it. It feels very precious. Mm. Can be. Yes, yes. Yeah, and that, that, that will involve perhaps unexpected sensations and feelings than, than when that person was alive that we tend to associate with relationships that are precious to us. Yeah involve a lot of new experiences which I think can be confusing for people after someone mm-hmm. has died how mm-hmm. can I be experiencing newness in this relationship yeah and this person's not physically here anymore but that seems yeah. to be a very real part of grief yeah and the question I would have is why wouldn't you be experiencing newness that somehow the world stopped evolving which it does feel like that or you would like it to actually we would like it to stop because everything, there has been a slowing down. You know, we're not as connected when we're in places of deep grief. But the beauty of that is that the world is continuing to move. <laughs> and we are, things are continuing to happen. And so we can, instead of feeling that as, a, as an assault, that the world doesn't get where you are, you know, the world does. And you get to rejoin. And... Mm. You know, thinking about that, about the disconnection from self, but particularly from world that can come with grief. And and back to what you were saying earlier around, you know, people's capacities to engage the senses, the smell, maybe just the taste of something on the lips, the sight of something different. You know, if, if, um, if you've been in a place of disconnection for a significant time, thinking, imagine being in a darkened room and then opening up the curtains, that's too much, there's too much mm-hmm. <laughs> light, too much brightness coming in. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that, that conversation or even that thought about reconnecting to a world that, that you're still in the process of relearning can feel overwhelming and too mm-hmm. much. So mm-hmm. I suppose what I'm, what I'm wondering towards is maybe some, some offerings akin to Mm-hmm. the scent of a spice or the taste of a mm-hmm. lemon, you know, things that you, you talked about, like some gentle offerings or inquiries of yeah. of what it might be to lean towards reconnection for, for people in grief. Yeah, really, really gentle offerings. Wrapping yourself in your favorite blanket or wearing a favorite shirt, 
listening to music that you love, you know, even if you still, if you're not able to appreciate it, treating yourself with care. It's not a magical trick. It's not that you have to do something extra or special, but that you are tending to yourself as you would somebody that you saw grieving, right? Treat yourself the same way you would another person, knowing that that actually matters. It does matter. Even just, you know, somebody just holding your hand. That's why the, your mentioning of the animals is so important. There isn't a request that needs to be made. There isn't, you just put your hand there and there's this contact, right? Um, taking a bath. I, I mean, that can almost sometimes feel too complicated, though. I honestly feel like these small things of like opening a window, it's, it's very subtle. The, the, sh- the shift of air can be that profound and that can be your reconnection. I opened the window today. It's, it's not that you have to magically somehow be feeling the reconnection. You're just gently reminding your body that you're still in the world. And if you feel so far away that that's not possible, that's where I feel like it's important to ask someone to help. Can you, can you come by and open a window for me? <laughs> you know, you're the friend and you've noticed the person hasn't had an open window for a while. So, you know, I'm going to come over and just going to open the windows and I'll close them before I go. Like, just entertain me for a minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It sounds, I mean, it, I think it's, I think what I guess I want to not do is give any sort of prescription, right? It's, again, like that allowing to be in the place of not connected, that you get to be there for a while. You get to just not care about anything. Yeah. Because especially like traumatic loss sudden loss there isn't a a leaping out of that it does take time and and what it also can what can really also help is is support that you know someone else is there somewhere somewhere even if you can't feel or hear or see them all of the time like a morse code you know (laughs) yeah yeah that's a good a good and i can suitably gentle and subtle kind of signaling and i think for people who are wondering about being companions in that in that process yeah i definitely wanted to echo yeah that the wariness around prescription you said earlier that you know that someone's grief will be in some sense will be their own because it's in process with all those other vastly unique experiences of their life and so you know, it won't be the window for everyone. But right, everyone exactly. will have the thing that is the window for them. <laughs> right. But the, but the window being the metaphor of back to the earth, right? That we all are breathing in air. This is a shared experience. Whether you are aware of it or not, you're only watching this because you are bringing, you're breathing air. So we can, that's a very shared experience that we can alter. I talk about that in psychedelic work, you know, that, that that's the, the real gift of psychedelics. It's not that it takes away sadness or, or fear. It's that you can, you can access both. You can have profound gratitude and experience beauty and be really distressed <laughs> and overwhelmed. There, that there's a reminder of both and. And usually in places of deep grief, there's no both and. There's just one thing. So reminders of other realities are, are important. Yeah, in, in helping to recognize that capacity doesn't necessarily mean feeling a lot more of that thing. Because yes. with grief or sadness, with sadness or pain, that can feel, yeah. yet no wonder people want to be kind of wary of not going towards that. But it yeah. sounds like what you're saying is, is this capacity to be with multiplicity, to be with this and this alongside each other, even though that feels like a contradiction. Right. And so when side. you can't do it, so when you're the one that has just lost a beloved and you're not able to do that, then you hopefully find someone, something that is doing that. So animals are doing that. They are doing both and. So you just need to be near them. Plants are doing both and. They're, they're not 
they're doing their thing, right? So just go be near it. And again, that, that relational quality, like just being aware that you are, um, that you're relational, I guess, is like, I can't, I'm trying to think of a better word. Mm -hmm. I think that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you for those reminders of relationality, but of, of remembering connection in that. Yeah, and even if you don't remember, I think that's the piece that I'm trying to, it's hard to articulate, but the beauty of being alive on the planet is you don't have to remember for it to be true. Mm. Mm. Is it like you can experience some of that before you're aware of the remembering, like the remembering comes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. after the encounter? Yeah. Or I can. Yeah. So having items or elements near you that are that that are in those both and places, you might not feel that connection. You might not be able to feel the support from the hand that's reaching out to you, and that's okay. You're going to come back from that place, right? And, and as a caregiver, if you're with someone who is so far away know that your presence is still a presence. Something is still happening. It's moving at a different pace than you might be comfortable with. And our current pace is pretty manic. Grief does not move at that pace. Returning from grief doesn't move at that pace. Subtle shifts are happening all of the time and we're not always noticing them. It helps us slow down to the pace of grief and not ask grief to come running to us. Yeah, that feels like such an important, um, important reminder. Yeah, Francis Weller talks about that. I know you've worked with Francis, that mm. geological time. Yeah. I think that's an important memory to remember that there are other, there are things moving at different paces than are chaotic. That's just one reality. It's not all the realities that are available to us. Yeah, and that the, there's a limitation in the, you know, the speed at which things move. Ironically, online where people will be watching or listening right, to this right. um, serves some purposes and serves some purposes well in terms of connection and information. But the the importance of highlighting that that is not only um, not the only one, but actually very unhelpful one when trying to be with experiences of grief. You know, as Francis reminds us that even that word comes from this connection to weight. Yeah. You know? yeah. And the being with heavy things makes sense to not try and do at great speed. Um, yeah. Yeah, so move, you know, I think of that sometimes like moving through water. And it can feel that just slows you down. It just moves through water. And then when it starts to feel like you're drowning in the water, that's a different quality. But again, if we can allow ourselves to be where we are, we have a better chance of knowing when we've gone too far or we can't get out. But if we're, if we're resisting the reality, it's hard to know what's really even happening for us. We might not be too far gone. We don't, we don't even know. We haven't really touched in. Yeah, and that encouragement for people if they are beginning to or are in the midst of that, that encouragement for people to to really reach out and flag that mm -hmm. the reality of that struggle. And plenty of people have deep, deep grief and can maintain their orientation to a lot of things, right? There's so many different ways that mm -hmm. this happens. But again, that that the importance of contact. You might lose your orientation. You might not be able to remember why you're there, where you are, 
what you should be doing and how. And so, again, orienting to someone else. You know, again, you're beginning again. You're, you're going to emerge from this threshold. It's a change. You're not going to come back again. I mean, I'm thinking about Francis a lot and talking with you. you. It is a change. So you are going to emerge different. So not even trying to return someplace. But actually going towards what's coming next for you. This life that is now altered. Yeah, and that that there is permission and an invitation for that pace to be very different than the one we may have been used to. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if that might, yeah, offer. I don't know if relief is the right word, but might offer just some permission to move yeah. more slowly, as so often the world is is demanding, or we even start to self police ourselves and demand that we move more swiftly. So yeah, I, we don't yeah. even get that much time off from work, right? You get two weeks or something. That's not there. It's like a blink of the eye. And again, you know, thinking about the vastness of experiences for some people, returning to activities, returning to that relational world, even if you don't, you haven't, of course, you haven't processed all of anything in two weeks. I mean, that's just not even an option. But it doesn't mean you can't be relational. So then that's another side of grief is that people are like, you know what, I'm going to get back to work. I actually need to, I want to stay busy. I want to stay in motion. And that isn't a negative either. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, again, you're, you're responding to and moving energy in a way that works for your system. The important thing is that you can know when that's not working. Right? And yeah. maybe that friend in the opposite way, instead of saying, pull me out of the house, says, hey, can you, can you actually get me out from work? I've been there for 60 hours this week. I'm actually losing myself into work. Yeah. I thought it was yeah. helpful. It's actually not helpful anymore. <laughs> right. And that part of people trying things and it being okay to change your mind. Yeah. And being okay to be like, I thought this was the thing that it was going to help. And turns out it didn't. <laughs> right. I thought I really liked that new person, but I actually don't want to see them again. You know, I thought I was falling in love with someone, but I'm not, you know. And yeah. Yeah. I yeah. was absolutely, you get to change your mind a thousand times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that there can be multiple paces that gr- being with the grief may require a slow pace and slow change over time. The activities of daily life may continue. Mm-hmm. The necessity of that may continue yeah. at a different pace, but that we can, again, as you said, be with more than, than one thing at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lady Bird, I, I really want to thank you for your um, yeah sharing from your years of, of practice and um, we have to talk about practice wisdom here. So, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really grateful for for your time and for what you've shared with us uh, today. We'll certainly connect people to other areas of your of your work as well. Um, thank you, yeah, thank, thank you thank for you having so me. It's lovely to just drop into this conversation. It felt very we had kind of created our own pace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and I'm very grateful for that. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Yes, thank you. Bye.